Hi, listeners, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director of WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us for another one of our special uncut episodes. Today's uncut session is part two of my interview with Kerwin Ray. Now, Kerwin is a legend of the business coaching industry, and he's an absolute powerhouse. He's helped thousands of businesses across 154 industries, and he's got 2 million social media followers. He's also the host of Unstoppable, which is consistently one of the top Australian business shows on Apple Podcasts. So when it comes to high performance and what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur, Kerwin is all over this stuff. In today's episode, Kerwin shares some incredible mindset techniques. He explains how he built his massive social media following And he's got some great insights into non-verbal communication or body language. He also reveals the one superpower that he thinks is most responsible for the success he's enjoyed so far. If you're an entrepreneur or business leader, you really won't want to miss this. On another note, just a quick update on how we're going with the new forthcoming series of Nerds of Business. Mindset of the Disruptive Entrepreneur is in the can. So we've interviewed all of our entrepreneurs and subject matter experts and we're in the final stages of post-production. So we should be back soon with the first episode of season three. Thanks for your patience and keep an eye out for that coming soon. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this special edition of Nerds of Business Uncut. I love data. I, I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems. You need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. Drown yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. <laughs> this is Nerds of Business. And look, this is, again, it's just nice segues here. You know, the, the next question I've got for you kind of jumps off that point, you know. I loved um, one of the things I saw in your social media um, in research for the, for this chat. Uh, there's a, a video piece there where you're talking about you know change your story, change your, change the game. You know, and everyone yes. has their own internal narrative. Everyone has their their story that they tell themselves, which then of course uh, dictates you know how their life plays out to a large extent. And so your proposition was change your story and change the game. What's one killer tip you could give to business owners to change their own story. Realize this, the incredibly powerful suggestive nature of the brain um, and how, like I, I do this exercise in a room of about 800 people where I suggest that every single person is going to behave in a very specific way. I suggest it to the entire room 34 times. The very next day, about 60 to 80% of the room execute on the behavior at the exact time that I suggested they would. And all I did was say to them that they were going to do it 34 times. And so when we start to understand the suggestible nature of our brain and the programmatic nature of our brain, we start to realize that I can input program suggestions. I can input, you know, suggestions that I'm stupid. If I tell myself I'm stupid, you know, every day, 34 times, what do you think I'm going to respond to? What do you think I'm going to, you know, my brain is going to respond in kind to the suggestion. And so for me, you know, I think, I know this is a bigger answer. It's not just a here, push this button, but if there was one button I'd, I'd encourage people to form is a surgical application of suggestion to themselves. Napoleon Hill referred to this as auto suggestion. One of the, you know, the 13 critical traits that he identified in the 500 wealthiest people at that time. And these are people that are very conscious of the suggestions that they're making themselves. Elite professional athletes, elite military, elite, you know, people in any, in any situation, they're very conscious of the narrative. Who's driving the narrative? You know, am I reacting to the narrative and I'm, and is it a, you know, is the, is the narrative noisy or am I f-ing controlling the narrative? I'm laying the script. I'm laying the tracks. I'm creating the code, you know, and that to me is something that I think is an incredibly important aspect that a lot of people become irresponsible for. They go, well, it's, oh, I, I'm just thinking like my mum. No, you're modeling what your mum thought. Okay, it's still your, you may may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility to wake up and do things differently so you don't pass this on to the next generation. And so that's that's actually a very interesting philosophical point here about personal responsibility. 
because there is a school, there are opposing schools of thought here, you know, that, uh, you know, some people are not responsible for their um, path in life because of their the, where they were born or, the yes, the upbringing they had the, um, and so on. Are, are you saying you, you reject that? I absolutely and utterly reject that. You know, you, you may not be at fault, but you are always at responsibility. Yep. You know, always responsible for the response, you know, because I, 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 I've, I've had a number of conversations with people. I say, and because my philosophy, everything is my fault. But then sometimes you sit down with people who share some stories with you and you go, whoa, that's big. That's heavy. And you go, you know what? That may not have been your fault, but now it's your responsibility to do something with it. That's going to be positive. Yep. Okay. And you may not have been at fault for the event, but you're at fault for the perspective. You're at fault for the response. You know, and it's now your responsibility to do something about it. And I think the the the, 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 the greatest misrepresentation that's ever been made to humanity is the blame game. You know, and the, the most powerful institutions in the world love the fact that we blame each other because we surrender our power for creation. We surrender our power for outcome and we start because when we're irresponsible and when we blame people, we are powerless. We are disempowered. You know, and the easiest the easiest people to manipulate, the easiest, easiest people to coerce, uh, are those people. And so, our goal really should be um, to to yeah to to play the opposite game of that. Well, look, you know, Kuhn, you're you're a man of many talents and interests. It's it's clear that you're very widely read. You've got ex, you know, extremely high energy. Uh, you know, you wear a lot of badges. You're an investor, a business owner, an entrepreneur, a mentor, a boss. Um, an extreme sports person, and of course, an ambassador for ADHD. Which Kerwin does the world need the most right now and why? That's a big question, isn't it? Oh, oof. you know, it's interesting because um, you look at my social media following and, you know, as you kindly pointed out, we've got, a, you know, almost a couple million followers on social media. But what's really interesting is my audience. You know, I'm the business guy. I'm the business performance guy. My specialty, my expertise is, um, you know, growing businesses very quickly. And I've been very good at it for 20 years. But 80, well, let's call it 70% of my audience on social media, they're not in business. Yeah. You know, because when you look at my content, it's on relationships, it's on parenting, it's on addiction, it's on mental health, it's on business as well. But it's a full spectrum of life. You know, and that's where I took to those 360 degrees as an entrepreneur. I'm, I share all of the degrees. You know, I don't, I don't hold anything back. I think the, the world needs um, uh, the version of Kerwin that's going to help more people. And the version of Kerwin that's going to help more people um, is, is the version of Kerwin that's bringing back a program called Power to Create. Uh, we created a program, well, I created a program five years ago. Well, actually, no, 10 years ago. I shelved it five years ago because I wanted to focus on the business side. We've blown the business side up significantly now to the point where we can bring Power to Create back. Power to Create is a mainstream program, performance, personal development, spiritual, you know, psychology, quantum mechanics, particle physics. It really is a complete integration of performance from, you know, from a range of different uh, angles. And right now, with everything I see going on, you know, I see more people needing that information. And I get to share that information by virtue of the little clips, you know, that we put out there. But that that is basically three days of user's manual. And that's what the world needs right now is a, is a better user's manual because the one that we've got right now, um, I think everyone's starting to realise is out of date. Very good point. And, and you touched on it a minute ago. I mean, when I went through your social accounts, uh, I, I that really struck me that you, there's a lot of content, particularly on the Facebook feed, around codependency, PTSD, imposter syndrome, syndrome and so on. You know, I, I was really struck by the consistent focus on common psychological challenges and conditions. Yeah, yes. And, and so I'm guessing that's because of your holistic view. Yeah, And it's the difference that makes the difference. It's the difference that makes the difference. You know, when I work with a business owner, I don't just build their business, I help them heal. And I know it sounds really f***ing woo-woo, right? But here's what I know. Like what prevents people from success is often they're carrying too much weight. Yep. They're carrying too much baggage. And so for me, you know, I've and I'm so blessed because I've had the baggage of ADHD. I've had the baggage of dyslexia. I've had the baggage of near-death experiences. I've had the baggage of, you know, addiction. I've had the baggage of, you know, uh, a stepfather was murdered when I was eight years of age. I've had the baggage of, you know, <clears throat> violence physical, mental, all sorts of trauma, you know, and by virtue of that, I've had to go through the journey of going, okay, I've got this condition, I've been told it's bad, maybe there's something good in it, maybe I can make it better, maybe I can use this to my advantage, and then I do, and then I'm like, I reckon there's other people out there that would really benefit from this, you know, from a different perspective on ADHD, a different perspective on PTSD, a different perspective on dyslexia, and so the reason that I talk about so many different 
threads is because I've just had so much of my own baggage. I've had so much of my, my own shit, but I'm just the kind of guy that has no issue in the world unpacking my bags publicly. Uh, and if anything, I talk about everything. So I've got nothing to hide from. Uh, and by virtue of me doing that, it serves a lot of people because there's a lot of people out there. Here's what I've learned too. And you've probably identified this, Darren. Entrepreneurs, they're a great crack bunch, but a lot of them are, uh, um, and I hope this doesn't come across as a negative um, implication or stereotype, but entrepreneurs for the most part can be a little bit of a broken bunch. You know, in most cases, most entrepreneurs that I have connected with have a story, a story of something, a trauma, a something, you know, and by virtue of business, they see business as a challenge. But unconsciously, the reason I think so many people are attracted to business who have baggage is because they know that that challenge is going to require personal work. And by virtue of that personal work, it's going to provide healing. I don't think this is a conscious association, but here's what we know. Now, business is very stressful. It's enormous levels of personal development. It confronts you with the stuff that you don't want to look at. Yep. And in most cases, it can be used as a vehicle of healing. And the reason I think there's so many entrepreneurs have psychological issues is because that's why they became entrepreneurs, because those psychological <laughs> issues, I can relate, <laughs> drove them. I can relate to that. I'll put my hand up there. Oh, yeah. mate, I put both hands on both feet up. I, yeah. You know, drove them to that to that point because I know for me personally, Personally, you know, that's what drove me, yep. you know, PTSD had such an impact on my life. And so I, it drove me, you know, ADHD, dyslexic, uh, trauma. Uh, it's just, it's all the stuff that drives me that I shared that I've discovered really does help unlock the hearts and minds and, and the souls of others that we can connect with in a meaningful way. But from a performance perspective, there is nothing faster than an athlete that's been carrying a 20 kilo bag. And then all of a sudden they put it down. Now that athlete's now fast. That's a very another very nice analogy. I get the feeling you've done this before, Kerwin. Uh, you're, you're really good at this speaking stuff. Uh, Thanks, mate. <laughs> um, and, and look, uh, you know, again, what you just said sort of leads naturally into one of the other questions that I've got here for you. Um, and it's, you know, regarding your very significant social media following, almost up at 2 million followers. And I know that you're a big fan of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Now he's probably, let's face it, in um, sort of business coaching, entrepreneur sort of circles, he's he's probably the absolute gold standard internationally. Um, and uh, I see that he's even pre presented at some of your events, uh, which is amazing. He has, yeah. What are the three most important things that you've learnt about building your amazing personal brand um, that you could share with our listeners? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, I do, I, I am very grateful to Gary because Gary, I hired Gary to speak at one of my events in 2015 and he took, he came to the back of the room, uh, I was in Las Vegas and he took about eight minutes to connect with me. And I think of those eight minutes, he spent seven minutes telling me how badly my social media sucked. Um, oh. And I got my ass kicked in a really beautiful way, but as a, by virtue, this is what happened. Um, you know, and as one of the things that I've learned is when it comes to social media, and look, there's a few things, but the first one is, you know, there's two ways that you can create content. You can either create content or you can document content. And ideally, your ability to, to create content or document content will fundamentally determine your ability to, con to complete the second most important thing, which is consistency. Okay. And that's where if you're not consistently posting content, you're going to find it very hard to build an audience, very hard to connect with an audience, very hard to be even liked by the engines themselves or the, the, the networks themselves. And so by virtue of being consistent, you have to have content. And if you're not producing content consistently, you're not going to have anything to post consistently. And so for me, you know, you've got to have a really good content strategy. And that's where I'm very pro documentation. Um, I'm on now my third document documentary um like we've created the first documentary was the social experiment which was i think 40 episodes the second documentary was uh k day which i think was 119 episodes and we're about to launch another documentary now which is called bracing for impact it's all around our response to covid um and so their features I guess you'd call their, you know, aspects of pillar content, yep. but I document everything I do. Like even this conversation right now is probably already, I've already identified at least probably 12 videos that this will be cut up into, yep. you know, just from this conversation. And so by virtue, my, I prefer to do intelligent content strategies and intelligent content strategies to me is how can I spend less time creating content and more time documenting meaningful content that's probably going to have a genuine impact. And so if I sit down to camera and I have this conversation with the camera, it's not going to land anywhere near as well as if I film me having a conversation with Darren, you know, talking about these things because yeah. it's a lot more authentic. It's a lot more natural. It's social. It looks like a social connection. Okay. And so by virtue of the mechanism of being a documentarian, by documenting content, you create more contents relative 
content. Like the content's more social because it's more real. Okay. It's not yeah. staged. It's not produced. Okay. Cause that's, that's more traditional style. And so step one, you've got to have a good content strategy in terms of the documentation or the creation side. Your strategy might be, well, I don't do anything that's entertaining enough to document. Well, great. Then you have to sit down at least, you know, a couple of times a week and you have to look at the camera and you need to go, Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about the four things you need to know when it comes to losing weight effectively and keeping it off. Okay. You're going to have to create content. It's going to have a different temperature, different kind of, um, I could guess uh, a different level of uh, sentiment. Sentiment. Yeah. Um, but you know, all the same, you need Number one, a good content strategy to producing, documenting. Number two, you need to be posting consistently. And number three, you need to understand, you know, where the attention is. And the attention's in the audience. You know, the attention's not in the social networks, in the audience. And if you don't show respect to the audience, um, then they're not going to listen to what you have to say. And so how do we show respect to the audience? Well, we listen. You know, we understand it's a social network. You know, it's not a broadcast network. A broadcast network is a one-way communication. Okay. A social network is about dialogue. It's about, you know, 89% of businesses don't respond to f-ing messages and posts on social media. 89%. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It blows my f-ing mind, Darren. And when you consider a conversation is the synthesis of the sale. Like once upon a time, marketers of the world, we spent all of our time and money Okay, to do promotions to generate leads to whereby we could call people and start a conversation that we hope would lead into a f-ing sale. Now we have people coming into our shop, aka social media, and starting to talk to us, but 89% of business owners turn around and f-ing ignore them. That's a conversation. <laughs> Conversation that, that's a is the new, and that's the problem because conversation is the new lead and people yeah. don't see that. One in five Instagram organic stories from a business will result in a direct message from a follower. That's the genesis of a conversation. What do you do with that? Well, you could just reply or start a conversation that builds trust, that builds intimacy, that builds connection. And as a natural consequence, who knows where that's going to go? Chances are transactionally. Uh, but if, and in most cases, authentically. And here's the best part, organically, without having to be a sales and marketing douchebag. <laughs> well, I, as a marketing douchebag, I, I won't take personal <laughs> offence to that. You know, I run a digital marketing agency, but it's, it's okay. I've got a thick, thick skin. I can, I, I can, I can look past that. No, look, I think there's a lot of value in what you're saying, and, and of course, you know, if you can get um, a lead or inquiry, you can build those relationships. Uh, uh, it's online. not hard to respond to a comment. Yeah, it's not right. hard to respond to a direct message. It's not hard to understand that anytime someone tries to talk to you, that is the genesis of a sale. Yeah, that's where sales start. They start at the beginning of a conversation. That's and right. if people are trying to talk to us and we're ignoring them, we're not respecting the audience. Yeah, you know, and that's where we can learn a lot from our audience in terms of that third thing, which is listen to the audience, talk to the audience. You know, because that's where most of your content ideas will come from, your product ideas. You know, because I don't just listen to my audience; I listen to my clients. You know, I have I have uh, boards of advisors for my for different businesses, and, I've, and the board of advisors that I've got for for BMI, which is a thirty plus million dollar organization. Okay, there's eight people on the board. Six of those people are my clients. Wow. Okay, that's unusual. That's very f-ing unusual. That's very unusual. Yeah. Very unusual. But I listen to my audience. Yeah. And I don't just listen to my audience. I listen to my clients because where do my greatest innovations come from? My audience and my clients. Because why? They're seeing things that I don't, you know? And oftentimes they're seeing it in a meaningful way as an observer that can give me some really incredible insights if I create the space for that to transpire. Well, Kerwin, um, you're obviously a very thoughtful person. I've only got two more questions for you. And one of them maybe kind of relates to what you just said there. Um this is a special recurring segment on Nerds of Business called It's Not That One. <laughs> Let's keep this in. This is a special recurring segment called Nerd Super Power. There we go. That was real, wasn't it? I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, so this is Nerd Super Power, Cohen. Um, and, you're, you know, look, you've obviously you've done a lot in your life Uh, You've got a lot of talents and a lot of uh, passions and enthusiasms. But if you had to sort of distill all of that down to one thing, what is what is your superpower? Oh gosh, that's a tough question. That's a really tough question. Um, Look, I'm I'm going to try and be as original as I can here, and I'd have to say my one of my greatest superpowers, and I've spent an in disproportionate amount of time developing this, is probably my level of awareness, and I. I don't say that in an arrogant way because when I, when I refer to this in the most part, cause I've spent 
to give you context, I spent about nine years studying with Paul Ekman and David, about 11 years with David Matsumoto, uh, Phil Houston of the CIA. So I've spent a disproportionate amount of time studying uh, nonverbal communication from um, from a security perspective, from an interrogation perspective, from a, you know, um, from the perspective of being able to see information that no one else can see, like Paul Ekman, uh, you know, he's responsible for training some of the, you know, some of the, the greatest, um, I guess you could say, uh, counter terrorist organizations as has Phil Houston, when it comes to being able to read facial expressions, micro facial expressions that happen within less than 0.25 of a second to be able to identify emotions that are being suppressed, to be able to identify in most cases, deceit, deception, or omission. Phil Houston, you know, with his um, L squared methods. And so I've spent a lot of time, like 15 years, I spent studying deception, just deception. And again, that ha- that was born as a result of being lied to one too many times and never wanting to be ca- caught again. And your kids, but, your kids are in for a world of pain when they oh, when they get fun. to teenagers. Like my God, they, they they've got no chance. Well, here's what's really interesting. Paul Ekman was a, um, a mentor of mine for a very long time. They even created a TV series on him called uh, Lie to Me, and. Um, Paul actually wrote, and his expertise was facial acquisition, or it was called um, micro expression techniques. So he developed uh, the, the, the the technology to identify different micro expressions. And um, what's interesting is he ended up writing a book with the Dalai Lama because what Paul didn't realize he was doing is he was actually teaching consciousness to police officers, consciousness to counterterrorism, because what he was teaching them to do was to learn how to slow things down to the point where they could see tiny little micro behaviors in the split of a second. And that takes an enormous level of awareness to do. It takes an enormous level of awareness to be able to see something that no one else can see because it's not only a micro expression, meaning it's a tiny fractional expression, but it only appears in some cases in point, you know, point one zero or point two five of a second, which is fleeting. And to be able to develop sensory acuity to the point where you can catch every single one of those you know, leakages as they're referred to, that takes an enormous level of awareness to be able to completely neutrally observe every single expression in a non-biased way to try and put the sentence together. Because this is what a lot of people don't realize, right? Non-verbal communication isn't in isolation. So most people go, if someone does this, you know, um, they're closing off. Well, no, they could be cold. Okay. But what is this Okay, in the sentence of what's going on, this is one word, you know, and a body communicates in sentences, a face communicates in sentences, energy communicates in sentences. And so one of the things that we have to do when we are reading nonverbal behaviors, we have very high levels of acuity, sensory acuity and awareness, but we need to be able to have a level of non-bias and (laughs) it's what's called truth bias, ignore the truth and focus on everything else to see what is really actually there. Um, and it's, uh, look, it's an incredible skill as a superpower, my poor kids, eh, like I feel for anyone that tries to come into my life and play games or game me, because honestly, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just something that I have developed as I said, 15 years of studying deception, developed an incredible skill that I now use in a whole range of other areas as well. Wow. That is one potent superpower. Um, and that might just be the best, uh, Best answer to that question because I asked all my guests that 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 uh, question and I've never had that particular superpower. So yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I'm a walking, talking lie detector. It's, <laughs> it's, it annoys the shit out of everybody. I bet it, it does. It. I'm, I'm sure it it's does. incredibly powerful, but it must be annoying to sometimes to close family well, and friends. Here's what's really interesting. When I first learnt it, because over the first five years, I experienced some up and downs emotionally because I was like, hang on a second, and this is going to be the kicker. Everybody lies. Everybody lies. Yeah. Yeah. But what I had to discover was not everybody's motive was the same okay. and not everybody's intent was the same. Yeah. You know, some people just, you know, lie because it's just how they've been brought up. You know, oh, I, oh no, I'm just not very good at that. Well, what do you, you're a professional at what you do, but you're thinking, you know, that's a lie. Mm. You know, there are so many ways that, you know, that, that um, uh, deception uh, has been used. And the more we understand about it, you know, the, the more we start to realize that it's very common. Yep. But everybody has their different reasons for doing it. And some people are telling a lie because they're trying to protect themselves. And sometimes, you know, they're protecting others. And sometimes it's protecting ego. And other times it's great. It, but here, here's one thing that I find really interesting from a deception in the study of human behaviors. People whose main driver in business or in bit or in work is that is money, they're eight times more likely 
if their purpose is to make money, number one driver, make money, eight times more likely to engage in deceit, deception, omissive, and fraudulent related behaviors. That's no surprise to me. I mean, yeah, that's no surprise to me. And I've, you know, uh, like you, I've been in business for quite a while now, and I've, I, I never actually got it in, into it really for for the money. Uh, it was always about achievement and you know wanting to um, you know reach cert, certain objectives. Uh, I did. I got into it because I didn't have any money. I got into business because it was missing, and then I made lots of money, and I was still f-ing miserable. And I was like, <laughs> hang on. That's not what was on the brochure. They said if I made lots of money, I'd be f***ing happy because that's what Disneyland showed me. And I just... It doesn't you know, quite work out that way. Lessons. Yeah. Well, um, Kerwin, it's been a delight talking with you. I've got one last question uh, left. Away. And um, this might be uh, my favourite uh, of all. Um, you know, I find that most top entrepreneurs are deep thinkers with a restless mind and that would absolutely apply to you. Um, now... Whether it's meditation, a nice bottle of red, or jumping out of a plane, which I know you do, um, but do you have a, a you know, a, a really favourite mental habit or process that you use to channel your creativity? Me- oh, meditation. It's uh, honestly, it's another superpower. I yep. probably meditated. I don't know. It's got to be over ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand hours. You know, in the last twenty six odd years. Wow. Um, and it's just. Uh, the in the impact that it has i just it, it again if you and if you study different forms of meditation transcendental is probably one of the most scientifically validated forms of meditation when you start to understand what what it does like what the neurology the biology it, it's it's there's nothing that can really beat it so for me that's probably my number one the second thing i really love to do is i love to spend time with my family like there's no greater way the fastest way to turn my mind off is, and this sounds really weird, is to get my partner to come and hold me. The moment she hugs me, I just, I'm gone. <laughs>